7 this morning. Exodus chapter 7. I will challenge you in, res- in light of that, though. We're gonna, uh, next time, if you're one of those folks that likes to listen to Caleb or, or uh, uh, whatever the other ones are locally, uh, uh, do some research. Do some research. Next time you listen to a song you like, find out about the artist. Can, can, I, can I say something right now? If I, let's just throw this out there. Let's say you come to church and you are a Bible-believing Christian and you believe this book is God's Word from cover to cover. And then I get up here and I preach a message that you really get, you, oh, that's so good. But then afterwards, you've come out and you shake my hand. I, I just want you to know I don't believe anything I just said. What would you do with my message? Would you be inclined to come back? I hope not. I hope not. And yet people do it with music all the time. Exodus chapter 7. Now, we're going we're gonna to have to uh, move quickly this morning. Got a lot of ground to cover. Some of you are saying that's not new, but... Uh, <laughs> We are going to look at a lot of scripture, so I'm preparing you, okay? Exodus chapter 7, Exodus 7, look at verse number 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Same chapter, look at verse number 22. And the magicians of Egypt, this is Exodus 7, verse 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. Chapter number 8, look at verse number 32. Chapter 8, verse 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Look at uh, chapter number 9, verse number 7. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Same chapter, look at verse number 34. The Calvinists would have you think that it was only the Lord that hardened Pharaoh's heart. Not true. Not true. All right. Pharaoh hardened his heart himself initially. Chapter 9, verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. But you know, this time he's taking some folks down with him, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Look at chapter number 14. Skip over a few chapters to the right. Exodus 14, verse 17. Now, I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. This is God talking now. And they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I've gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. Same chapter, look down at verse number 27. Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. What did we just get done reading? We just got, we just got done reading about a man's life, a man named Pharaoh. And his heart being hard. Let me ask you this. What happened to that guy? Whatever happened to Pharaoh? You ever stop and think about people in the Bible? They did not just appear on planet Earth the way you read about them as adults. Understand one day Pharaoh was a baby. His mom held little Pharaoh in his arms and rocked him and sang a lullaby to him and put him to bed at night. Fed him, took care of him. He was just a sweet little baby. What happened to him? progressive. It's gradual. You know one thing I know about the man? Man has not changed in 6,000 years. Okay, so now somebody manufactures our clothing and we put on cologne and deodorant and we do this and we do that. But you know what you're doing? You're just covering the filth of the flesh is all you're doing. The flesh and man's nature is still what it is. And, And man's heart without God's influence gets hard over time. And I want, to, I want you to be careful. I, I, I want you to see the process of the hardening of the heart this morning. I believe you can come to church, you can hear the message, you can listen to a good song, and you can leave and let God do nothing in your life and harden your heart towards truth. What did it cost Pharaoh? His economy was obliterated. The crops, the harvest, that was gone. 
disease, pestilence of lice, the death of thousands. You understand Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37 numbers, it says about the children of Israel, when they left, there was about 600,000 men that were like uh, men that were ready armed for war. That means they were at least 20 years old. 600,000 Jews, not counting the women and the children. More than likely, 2 million, maybe as much as 3 million, left during the Exodus. What does that tell you about the population of Egypt? Millions of people. Millions of people in Egypt. And you know what you know about Egypt? In the story, Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, Look, you got one last chance. If you don't repent, every firstborn in the land is going to die. How many thousands, maybe millions, cried that one night? Why? Because one person hardened their heart. How about his army? Wiped out. Why? One man hardening his heart. Hard hearts destroy lives, don't they? Yeah. Relationships, both horizontally, horizontally and vertically. Jesus Christ said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. What am I saying? That heart of yours can get hard. Look at Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter 6. By way of introduction, I want to point out a few things about the heart and what that word really means to understand. For me to say, be careful that your heart does not become hard. You have to first understand what the heart is. Look, look at Genesis chapter number 6. And I understand you may think, well, it's an organ inside your body. And it, it runs. It's the main organ in the, in the uh, circulatory system. And, and it pumps the blood to all the body. And it retakes that blood and it circulates it. I'm not talking about that physical organ inside of you. All right, look at Genesis chapter number 6 and look at verse number 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts... Of his heart was only evil continually. That's the first mention of the word heart in the Bible. And guess what it's associated with? Evil, <laughs> as it relates to man. But I want you to see that God is not a God that is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So look at the next verse. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him. Who's the him? God. It grieved him at his heart. You say, what is the heart? It's the center of the thoughts and emotions. Look at Genesis chapter 17. Go there if you would. Genesis 17. This morning I'm not talking to you about an organ inside your body. As important as it is that your heart remains healthy for your body, and that you keep that thing pumping and you exercise and get the rate up and get it down and all that stuff. As important as that is, the heart I'm talking about this morning is that is so much more important. This body's going to perish, guys. And look, I'm not saying you shouldn't be healthy, but I've known people that have run. I read a story about a man that ran 80 miles every week. And at the age of 50, the guy died. You might go, well, yeah, he ran 80 miles a week. Of course he's going to die. You know? But I mean, his heart was healthy. And guess what happened? Out of nowhere, heart attack, gone. You could be the healthiest person in the world physically and spiritually be dying. How's your heart this morning? Genesis 17, look at verse 17. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his mind. Is that what it says? In his heart. Shall a child be born in him that is 100 years old. You know what the heart is? It's the center of thoughts and emotions, but the heart speaks, and eventually that speaking comes through the mouth. Jesus Christ says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Look at Exodus chapter 35. Go there with me if you would. What is the heart? Why is it so important to God? It's the center of thoughts and emotions. It, it's the place where thoughts are formulated, and those thoughts are formed into words, and eventually... The words that are in the center of who you are come out of your mouth. And let me say this, it's not just that, it's the center of your will. Look at Exodus chapter 35, look at verse number 5. Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing what? 
heart. When you decide to sacrifice for God, you decide to do anything for the Lord, it starts there. It's the center of your will. When you decide to choose sin over God, it starts there. It's the center of where your will is exercised. Amen. Go over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. You know the best dictionary, the best commentary on the Bible is the what? Bible. The Bible, right? See, some of you visiting go, oh, I came into a church where everybody's brainwashed. The center, you know, the, 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 the commentary of the Bible is the Bible, you know. <laughs> Matthew 12, Matthew 12. Look at verse number 40. Matthew 12 and verse 40, and it says here, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? And you know what the Bible says. He that ascended is also he that first descended into the lower parts of the earth. When he's talking about the heart of the earth, he's talking about the center of the earth, correct? So we talk about the heart of man. What are we talking about? The center of who you are. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Good advice in Proverbs, amen. Proverbs chapter 4. Every single issue in your life stems from your heart. You believe that? Yes. If you believe that, then it, you may want to pay attention to what goes on with your heart. Proverbs 4, look at verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If there's anything I've learned about man and man's history, it's in 6,000 years man's heart has not changed. Without the intervention of the Holy Spirit of God in a man's life, that heart becomes hard over time. And I want to talk to you about some ways that your heart can be hardened today. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Brother Joel, would you mind... Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. But Wayne touched on this a little bit on Wednesday night. He touched on it quite a bit, actually. And if I could, maybe just grab the baton from you, brother, from Wednesday night and pick it up here. Mark chapter 6, verse number 37. Mark chapter 6, I'm sorry, look at, excuse me, verse, uh, no, that's it, verse 37. He answered and said to them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. You know the rest of the story? You know what the Lord does? Verse 41, when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, 
he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Look at, if you would though, at verse number 46. After Jesus Christ does this great miracle, he sends the multitudes away. And he does that in verse 46 for a particular purpose. The Bible says he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone the land. He had sent his disciples to go to the other side. And the Bible says here that he sees them, verse 48. He saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, just like the Lord at the very last hour, amen, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. You ever stop and just think about this? Everyone always points out the fact that the fourth watch of the night is a great picture of how God comes to us in our darkest hour. That's true. But you know what else I'm thinking about? He had a long prayer session with the Father. <laughs> he comes in that fourth, night, uh, fourth watch of the night, and he would have passed by them. And in verse 49, they think that they see a spirit. In verse 50, he says, Be of good cheer, it is I be not afraid. In verse 51, he went up unto them in the ship, and the wind ceased. They were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. <laughs> Why did they wonder? <laughs> did they not just see the same man take five loaves and two fishes and feed thousands of people? Amen. Why would they wonder? <laughs> I mean, it's like this, man. The winds and the waves, uh, everything's coming in, crashing the lightning over here. And the boat looks like it's about to capsize. And Jesus Christ talks to them. And they go, oh, it's the Lord, it's the Master, it's our Rabbi, it's our Teacher. Uh, Jesus, come save us. And as soon as he climbs into that ship, everything stops. Wow, Lord, I guess if you're with us in the boat, we shouldn't be afraid. That's right, but you shouldn't have been afraid whether I was in the boat or not, because I'm always with you. Didn't I tell you that? Amen, bro. But look at verse 52. Why did they wonder? Verse 52 says they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Hasn't God proven to you his miraculous power to provide? Has he not done that for you? And yet the next time the storm comes, what do you do? Disbelief. Disbelief. I know what he did then, but I don't know if he can do it again. <laughs> I sit down and talk to people, and, and you know, knocking at this older gentleman's door yesterday, and, and uh, I gave this during Sunday school, and he's talking about how he just believes everything just sort of came out of nowhere. And, and I tell the guy, I said, can, you know, look at your car. Did your car just show up in your driveway? Or did someone design that thing and then manufacture it, and then you ended up buying it? Isn't that how that happened? Well, well yeah. And we explain to people that God is so great. And so powerful that all he does is he speaks, and it is. Amen. Amen. And yet, when there's a problem, <laughs> disbelief. And you know what happens? That disbelief will harden your heart. You know, you'll say, I know what the Bible says, but I don't believe it. My God shall, shall provide for all your need in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what it says? He'll supply all your need. Isn't that what it says? Oh, yeah, I believe it. I'm a King James Bibler. Yep, that's it. That's what it says. Amen. But do you really believe it? Jesus Christ displayed his power to plan, his power to prioritize, his power to provoke heaven when he looked up and he prayed to the Father. Boy, we pray over our meals, don't we? But I have never prayed over my meal and it opened my eyes. And there's five times as much stuff there. That's good. Amen. I mean, that's a prayer that moves heaven. It's not a simple, okay, uh, Jesus blesses, uh, Lord bless his food in Jesus' name. Amen. He looks up, and whatever it is that he says to the Father when he breaks that loaf, it moves heaven. Oh. And that's your high priest. And he can move heaven for you. Isn't that great? <laughs> he had power to... Take something and 
and break it. Now, I don't know about you, but usually when man breaks something, it's good for nothing. <laughs> I have a garbage disposal, the insincorator, in the back of my car right now. And it's supposed to be top of the line. I mean, nothing's going to clog this thing. Yeah, well, tell me that. You know, I'm there with my suit on. I'm trying to get this thing. In the, and and I'm, I'm, you guys know me and, stu- and mechanical things. It ain't pretty. It's never pretty. And I got that. I can do that much. So I can handle, I think, getting it off. Getting it back on? I don't know. <laughs> getting this thing off. And I'm thinking to myself, who's the jerk that designed this insincorator? It was top of the line. Oh, yeah, full, a great thing. And it isn't working right now. It's broken. It's not better than it was before. It's broke. I can't do anything with it. Only God can take something and break it. And go, here, you have some now. And you have some now. (laughs) They watched that. His power to provide. They saw it. And yet they disbelieved. Look at Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. Mark chapter 16. Your heart will get hard when the Lord provides for you and you doubt Him. When you know that He is capable, we sing the song. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to Him for rest. Our God is able (laughs) to deliver thee. And you know that, and you sing it, and yet tomorrow something's going to happen, and you're going to throw your arms up like you've just experienced the great tribulation. It's the end of the world. (coughs) Why? Because you say one thing out of the mouth, but in the heart, bowing the knee to Jesus Christ and accepting it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, and saying, I don't just believe it, I'm going to live it. You know what's hard to do? I know it's hard. It's hard when something that you are not expecting, something that you are just maybe even praying that it doesn't happen, and it happens. And you have to face that thing, and instead of being angry, and instead of cursing God, and instead of being angry towards people around you, instead you say, praise the Lord. Somehow God's going to prove himself. That sounds good in a message. Tomorrow morning when you have a flat tire on the way to work, you try that. It's not so easy, is it? But that's what real belief is. And over time, when God does it over time and time and time again, when you face those things, you continually harden your heart without realizing it. Mark 16. Another interesting one. Mark 16, verse number 12. You see that they disbelieved his ability to provide. Mark 16, look at verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form. This is Jesus Christ, after he rose from the dead, unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. If you want to read about that, you read, I think, Luke 24, when they're going on the road to Emmaus. And they went and told it unto the residue. The residue of what? The residue of the disciples. Neither (laughs) believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, guys, let me say this. If Jesus Christ never mentioned him dying and rising from the dead, I could maybe excuse this. I mean, let's say that you're a disciple and Jesus Christ never mentions he's going to die. Never mentions he's going to rise from the dead. Never mentions he's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners and spit on and mocked on. This makes sense. Doubting somebody saying that they saw the Lord, that makes total sense. But it doesn't in light of Matthew 17, verse 9. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. It makes no sense in light of Mark chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. It makes no sense in light of Matthew 20, verse 19. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. 
It makes no sense in light of John 2.19. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And he spake of the temple of his body. It makes no sense in light of the fact that over and over and over, he told them about his resurrection. And yet, when it happened, they didn't believe it. You know what the Lord can do? He can take a dead thing and give it life. Amen? All Scripture is given by inspiration. Do you understand what you have in your hand this morning? You go, well, yeah, I've got paper, and I've got ink, and I've got leather, calfskin leather binding, and I've got this little ribbon that runs through the middle of it. And you know what? You're 100% right. If you did not have the Holy Spirit of God inspiring this, that's all you would have. But He inspired it. Gave it life. Amen. And there was a day and time for me, it was about 20 years ago, to be exact, because I'm 33, right? <laughs> 22 years ago. At Silver State Baptist Youth Camp, I bowed the knee and I said, Lord, I, I, I don't know that I've ever really done this before. I, I'm not sure that I'm saying I, I think I was trusting religion. I think I was trusting my, being in a Christian family. But I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ. And on that moment, you know what he did? He said, made a dead spirit a living spirit again. Amen. Jesus Christ in John chapter 11 tells those that are grieving at the grave of Lazarus that he would raise him again. And he breathed out the words, Lazarus come forth, and a dead thing gained life again. Amen. Three days after Jesus had been crucified, they just think it's a dead body in a tomb, but little to their knowledge. And I would love to have seen that, wouldn't you? Because we know that he descended and that he ascended. We understand all those things. But, but that was in the, in, the, in the spiritual world, if you will. The body was there. And, and as the body lied there, can you imagine as he leads captivity captive and as he comes back to take on that bodily form again, that for the first time in three days, life infused into the body of Jesus Christ again. Oh, man. You believe that? There's some dead things in your life. Some dead hopes. Some of you hoped your spouse would get saved. Some of you hoped that your children would all be in church. Some of you have dreams about things that didn't turn out quite the way that you would expect them to. And they died. Those expectations led, uh, the, the Bible says, a uh, hope deferred maketh the heart what? Sick. Some of your hearts are sick because you expected things to happen a certain way and they didn't. Those hopes, those dreams, those expectations died. And the Lord is saying, look, if I can do this and I can raise Lazarus and I can raise Jairus' daughter and I can rise from the dead and lay down my life and take it up again, I can take those dead things and give them life. Those expectations, those prayers, those prayers that you would spend hours maybe uh, just sweating and praying and crying over. And now you say, I'm not going to pray about it anymore because it's just not going to happen. Been there? And God says, hey, I'll take that. <laughs> I'll make it alive again. Or you can stay in disbelief. You know what the disciples did? They hardened their hearts. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. The Lord can sustain you. He can resurrect you. Let me say this as well. He can bring you into a place of rest and victory as a Christian. And I know I've heard a lot of people refer to Canaan land as a picture of heaven, but I, I see it more as a picture, a type of victorious Christian living. You say, why is that? Because even when they enter into that place, they have to defend it. Guess what? We're going to a place when we die, guys, we'll never have to defend. <laughs> yeah. 
we'll never have to worry about. Sin will never harm anymore. But in this life, the Lord wants to bring you into that promised land, into a place of victory. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says this about that generation of Israelites that wandered in the wilderness. Verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now let's just face it. Let's just face it. When we talk about an evil heart, we think of a murderer, we think of a rapist, we think of a thief, we think of a, of a, of a gambler, we think of a, 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 an embezzler. <laughs> you don't think of the Christian that just says, I don't believe you, God. But that's what God says. It's an evil heart of unbelief. And he says, in departing from the living God, but exhort one another to daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit <laughs> not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sin whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? You know what they never experienced? They never experienced the promised land. You say, why was that? Because of unbelief. An evil heart of unbelief. You say, what is that? That is the Lord trying to get you to a place of victory and rest. Amen. Look at uh, chapter 3. Look at verse number 19, if you would. Chapter 3, verse number 19. Our parents are actively engaged in training. Amen. Hebrews 3, verse 19. Some of you might even think, my kid can't sit still through church. Guess what? You keep trying, amen? amen. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. I don't want to pick on but but really, you can get to a place as a parent where you get tired of taking them out, applying the rod of charity and discipline, amen, <laughs> and bringing them back and thinking they can never do it. Well, and I'm not trying to pick on these folks, but you have a bunch of kids, a whole slew of them, and they're sitting. And I can tell you this, they weren't born that way. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Hebrews 3, look at verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. So what was it that they were supposed to enter into? A place of rest. Important lessons are given by the alternation of the two ideas of faith and unbelief. Obedience and disobedience. Disobedience is the root of unbelief. Unbelief is the mother of further disobedience. You see the cycle there? It's like a cat chasing its tail. I have to admit, I don't mind watching that. It's pretty funny. I like seeing a cat torture itself. I like to be the one inflicted on the cat, but I can't because my kids love them. But that's what you are like as a Christian, you know that? As a Christian, whenever you say, I'm not going to believe God, then it becomes an act of disobedience, and that disobedience leads to further disbelief. If faith is not exercised, excuse me, faith is voluntary submission within a person's own power. If faith is not exercised, the true cause lies deeper than all intellectual reasons. It lies in the moral aversion of human will and in the pride of independence, which says, who is Lord over us? Why should we have to depend on Jesus Christ? As faith is obedience and submission. So faith breeds obedience, but unbelief, disbelief, leads on to higher-handed rebellion. With dreadful reciprocity of influence, the less one trusts, listen, the more he disobeys. The more he disobeys, the less he trusts. Find that cycle in your life? Belief and disbelief. You know what they are? They're a matter of the will. When Jesus Christ says to Jairus, only believe, he's presenting to Jairus an opportunity to exercise his will and place his faith in the Lord or not do so. Don't harden your heart by disbelief. You know what you're going to miss out on? God's power to sustain you, to resurrect you, and bring you to rest. 
Hebrews 3, you're already there. Look at verse number 13. Can I say this? Your heart will get hardened, not just by disbelief, but by deception. By deception. Hebrews 3, verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Can I say the world's done a great job of deceiving souls and making hearts hard by deception? And I'm not just talking about the hearts of the souls of men and women that are outside of these walls. Maybe even some of you. How about this? Your sin will deceive you into thinking, just one more look won't hurt. One more drink won't affect me. One more flirt won't hurt my marriage. One more gamble. One more post online gossiping about somebody else. One more word to my spouse in anger. Why is that you're deceived? You think you're running that thing, and it's running you. How about this one? If I can get rid of God through science, I don't have to answer to Him. Guess what? That's a lie. You're still going to answer to Him. How about this one? <laughs> Similar to see anything in my attitude that I came to church with is my business, and it won't affect anybody. Hey, uh, you, one of these days, I really think, I think everybody ought to have a chance to preach, ladies included. Just take it on, on with you ladies, okay? Ladies on ladies, all right? We'll do that sometime. And you'll see, there's times where you preach, and you're talking, and boy, there is a brick wall there. I say, man, church was off today. Something was wrong with pastor. And it could have been something off with me. I'm off a lot. <laughs> man. You say 14 years. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, by two years, I got you. I thought my wife said by 14 years. I'm like, that's our anniversary. Thanks, babe. I've been married for 14 years. Been off that much. But here's the point. Sometimes it's the attitude you come in with. How about this? One more night with the frogs won't hurt. Pharaoh? I mean, then where we started. We started this message off by looking at Pharaoh, how he hardened his heart. I want you to read James chapter 1. Go with me there. And as you turn to James chapter 1, I want you to consider what Paul said in Romans 7 when he said, Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. James chapter 1, go there, just a book over to the right. James 1 verse 14 says, Every man, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And I want you to focus on verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, not when you're finished with it, pal, when it's finished with you, bringeth forth death. Pharaoh has an opportunity to get Moses to pray for him. Samson, you guys know the story of Samson. So what was Samson's problem? Well, the green vines, he broke. And he got up and he whipped the Philistines. Guess what he does the next night? Hey, Delilah, it's new ropes. I lied, it wasn't vines, it's ropes. Use new ropes, and that, it'll, it'll break my, my weakness. And you know what? He recovered from that. Then the next one, I think this one's hilarious. You ever, you ever read the Bible and actually think about it? You know, he tells her, well, if you braid my hair and you put it in a weave and all, what a weird thing. <laughs> yeah, honey, you know, he just wanted a nice head massage is all he wanted. You know, that's what he got out of that thing. She weaves his hair and he wakes up and he whoops them all again. And that last time, she just keeps coming back and keeps coming back like sin will. And keeps coming and keeps coming because you play with sin and it won't go away. And eventually he goes, all right, look, if you cut my hair. So he wakes up. He's never felt weakness before. Why would he feel weakness? Why would he think he would feel weakness? And he wakes up in that moment, ready to attack and avenge himself as he did the latter night and the night before that. And as he gets up, and he, it's almost like I can envision this, guys. You ever had those dreams? I've had these dreams where I'm going to punch somebody, and this. It's like you're just, it's like air. 
And you know, I don't know why that is. It's like my worst nightmare. I, you know, someone come to attack my family, or, and, it's, and it's just this, uh, you know? And it doesn't make contact with them, and then I get beat up, and the rest is awful. And you laugh about that, but can you imagine Samson? Going to take that swing like he did before, and maybe going to bring the guy's head into his knee like he had before. I mean, ultimate fighting has nothing on the Bible. Yeah. And he's going to, and he, he just, all of a sudden, he falls to his knees. And in a day, his eyes are taken out. He can't see. And there's the mighty Samson that wants to avenge the children of Israel lying there, standing between two pillars during a Philistine party as they make fun of him and they ridicule not only him but his God. Why? Sin. But back to Pharaoh. Not only will sin deceive you, can I say this? You will deceive you. You need to understand something about the Pharaohs. In 3000 BC, the first dynasties appeared in Egypt with the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. The rulers of these dynasties were equated with the gods and with the duties and obligations due to those gods. As supreme ruler of the people, the Pharaoh was considered a god on earth. The intermediary between the gods and the people. And when he died, he was thought to become Osiris, the god of the dead. I mean... Whatever happened to Pharaoh? Well, he believed the hype about himself long enough to when the real God actually showed up, he didn't react the right way. Imagine you experienced seven days of bloody water. And your people, your, your people that you're, you're, you're there as a as representative of, as Pharaoh, your Egyptian people, are having to take their shovels and their spades and go around the rivers, around the water supply, and dig low enough in the earth. That's what the Bible says they did. Around the rivers to get clean water. But why did Pharaoh care? Well, they'd bring him water. It didn't affect him. And, and the next plague, the next thing that happens in, in Exodus chapter number 8, Moses, God tells Moses, bring frogs out of the rivers. It's all like Genesis. Everything that's living comes forth out of the water, right? brings the frogs out of the rivers, and they just cover the land. Now, we've had a lot of rain lately for Colorado. And I'll tell you, man, for, for Colorado, I've seen a lot of frogs. On our property, our kids are always... When I see my kids doing this, you know, when they're running around, I know what they're doing. I can see from a mile away, they're trying to catch a frog, is what they're doing. Frogs all over the place, but can you imagine not being able to take a step without a frog being underneath your foot? That, the devastation that would have on the land. Now I want you to see something. Go back to Exodus chapter number 8. Exodus chapter number 8. Look at verse number 8. Well, here's something interesting. Look at verse 5. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Now, here's what's interesting. Look at verse 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. But I want you to consider something. When Pharaoh wants to get rid of the frogs, does he go to the magicians? No. They had power to create a mess, is what they did, but they couldn't fix it. When you try to, look, the world will provide their solutions. Oh, yeah, God can do that for you, so can we. You pray to your God for provision, here's a credit card. You do this, and look, we have something better for you. Here, try this out. But at the end of the day, you know where Pharaoh went when he had a real problem and he didn't know what to do? He went to the men of God. And look what happens here in verse 8. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people. And I will let the people go that they may sacrifice unto the Lord. In Moses, verse 9, Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee? 
and for thy servants, and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only. And this is what blows me away. Amen. Verse 10. He's got a chance. Look, he knows that Moses is the only one that can take it away. And Moses is going to. And he's already seen that God was the one that brought the, the blood in the waters, and God healed that in seven days. And he goes to Moses and says, look, you're the only one that can do this. Would you pray to your God for me? You know, Moses says, okay, when would you let me pray? Tomorrow. You say, what is that? I can handle it. Yeah, it's bad. My sin is bad, and it's caused problems. I can handle it. Now look, I'm going to tell you right now, there are some things that you as a Christian are buried pretty deep in your heart right now, and only you and God know about them. And as long as you keep them buried deep in that heart and you don't do anything with them but just let them stay there and fester, let me tell you something right now, your heart will get hard to sin. Imagine this. Imagine a kid at five years old gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar and the mom comes by and she says, Daddy's coming home. You know what that kid does? That kid, no, 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 right? But when they're 16 and 17 years old, if you don't deal with that, you know what happens? I don't care what they say. But cops are a bunch of pigs. I don't need to listen to nobody. What? Right? Right? right. What is that? They got hard. Hard. And some of you are saying right now, well, good thing I'm not a punk teenager. <laughs> maybe not. But maybe you're a Christian whose heart is hardened because of sin, regardless of your age. You know what Pharaoh says? He says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? He believed the lie. He was self-sufficient. He didn't need anybody. He was Pharaoh. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. One time a school teacher lost her life savings in a business scheme, sort of like a Ponzi scheme. It had been elaborately explained to her by a swindler. After she lost everything, the uh, Better Business Bureau was in contact with her, and they said, ma'am, why didn't you come to us? You, she's like, I've always known about you. And why didn't you come to us? Because I was afraid you would tell me I shouldn't do it. So you'd rather not hear the truth that will keep you from it than to experience the great loss. What was that? Self-deception. There's also satanic deception. Yesterday, I we done playing basketball. And uh, by the way, it's not a sin to sweat. It's good. Amen. We're coming walking back across the street. And, uh, and walking back across the street, I'm, I'm walking this way. And last week, I, I preached to you guys. Now, the Lord will do this to me. I'll preach something to you, and he'll go, okay, really? Um. I had a schedule. I had somewhere to be, something I was supposed to be doing after that. And uh, this guy comes, and literally, I'm walking across the street, and he sits down right in front of me on a, underneath a tree. You can't really pass that up, can you? I guess you could, but it'd be dumb. And, and, and I saw this young man sit down, and I, I sat down and talked with him. I said, hey, let me ask you something. I walked by him, and this is how I opened up the conversation. Because people in Colorado love, in the West, and in our new age culture, love to think of themselves as open-minded. So I walked by him and said, hey, are you open-minded? He goes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you or are you not? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, would you read this? He said, sure. So I sat down. It's one of those moments where the Lord says, that's not enough. Take a seat. And I sat down and I said, how old are you, man? 17. What's your name? Oh, my name's Zach. Yeah, I'm Adrian. Nice to meet you. What grade are you going into? Senior in high school. Nice, man. So uh, let me ask you, you're about to embark on the last year of high school. What's next? Well, I want to go to school for this, and I want to do this. So what about after that? Uh, this and this and this. What about way after that? What about eternity? Well, I don't really believe in any of that. I said, why is that? I believe in what I can see. I said, okay. Look around. Where did it come from? Amen. Well, I, I believe in, in Big Bang. So, okay. 
I said, so you believe that the cars in that parking lot exploded, and there they are. Car manufacturing factory, man, one day that stupid maintenance guy that was supposed to fix the machine didn't do his job, and boom, it all explodes and goes everywhere, and the robot arms are flying. Have you ever been to a car manufacturing facility? They got all kinds of cool robots going on. They have trolleys that literally carry stuff from one place to another, no one having to do anything. And all of a sudden, boom, it explodes. And after that explosion comes out an F-150. Right? Well, no, that, that's, that's not like that. I said, okay, but that's what happened here with this? I said, you pull the earth so many thousand miles away from the sun, we freeze. So many miles towards the sun, we burn up. That's an accident. Your heart beats so many times a minute. If it beats too fast, you die. If it beats too slow, you die. That's an accident. The, the cells in your body replenish themselves every seven years. Someone didn't, it just, just happens that way. There was no, just randomly, just boom, it happened. There was no design in that. You say, what is that? That's a young man who's been deceived into believing a bunch of garbage. Amen. My heart breaks for them. I don't look down on him. I feel bad for him. Man, I love that kid. I so you don't know him. I love his soul. I don't want him to go to hell. You know what the worst part was? When we talk about things, I realized this kid was not totally void of God in his life. He said, I used to be a youth group leader. Grace Community Church in some place in New Mexico. And I said, what happened, man? I said, I was just forced to go, didn't really care for it, didn't really believe it. I said, toward the end of the conversation, I talked to him a little bit. I said, you're open-minded, right? He said, you were. Yeah. I said, so you're going to read that, right? He said, yeah. Started off with, there is no God, there's no afterlife. At the end of the conversation, he simply said, I don't know. I said, now you're being honest. I don't know is a much better answer. I said, if I got you, a, would, you read, would you open up a Bible? He said, yeah. I said, can you hold on? I'll go get you one. He said, no, no, that's okay. I said, well, you just said you'd open up, you'd read it. He said, I got two at home. Said, you, you got two Bibles at home? He said, yeah, there's one that I just, I don't know why, I just kept it. I said, I think you know why you kept it. Go back and read it. What happened to that young man? I don't know. Someone named Dr. So-and-so said something was true, and he swallowed it. Teacher at school, fill in the blank. What is that deception? Your heart will get hardened because of deception. Can I say this? Your heart will get hardened because of delight. Look at Hebrews chapter number 3. Go back there. We're spending a lot of time in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Some of you may not believe this, but I, I do try to keep uh, I do try to keep note of time. In the day and age in which we live in, I understand people's attention spans are not what they used to be. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. I mean we're we're used to lights and pops and noises and this and that, and so after so much time goes by, sometimes people tend to just drift away. I pray you don't. And, and I'll also say this. I, I, and I don't mean this to be offensive. I will apologize for going a little bit longer in preaching when you apologize for watching three-hour movies. Amen. 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 Hebrews chapter 3, look at verse number 8. He says, There harden not your hearts as in, the day, in, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, look at verse 11, So I swear my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Verse 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, you say, what's going on there? They wanted a party. You know what a lot of Christians want? Can I say this? We want the promised land without a battle. We want the crown without the suffering. <laughs> we want the glory without the death. Guys, our own Savior did not experience the glory of the right hand of the Father until he first yielded to death. The trouble with some self-made men is that they worship their own creator. Amen. Roy DeLamont was the chaplain at Payne College in Georgia. 
He preached the shortest sermon in the college's history. Now the topic and the subject wasn't, the, the, the title of the message was actually pretty long. Some of you are hoping like I do this someday, maybe, maybe. <laughs> what does Christ answer when we ask, Lord, what's in religion for me? That was the title of the message. He opened up his Bible. He said, here's the title of my message. Here's my answer. Nothing. He closed his Bible and left. What's in it for me? He later explained the one word sermon was meant for people brought up on the gimme, gimme gospel. When asked how long it took him to prepare that message, he said 20 years. Yeah. It's a gimme, gimme gospel, isn't it? That's what we're used to. All right, business transaction. God, you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Well, like Jacob. Lord, you'll be my God if you do this and this and this and this and this. You meet my checklist, and I'll let you be my God. It's kind of you, Jacob. It's real nice. <laughs> you ever catch yourself talking like Peter? Behold, we have forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have there for? God, I go to this church where he preaches a long time. What do I get out of this, Lord? God, I quit going to these places that I shouldn't go, and I've been bringing my family to church, and I've been doing this, and I've been doing this, and Lord, what's in it for me? You ever catch yourself doing that? You say, what is that? Self, delight. Now these people, think about this, in chapter 32, they're just a bunch of party animals, man. I mean, they've got this calf, and they're dancing, and they're just having a good time. You would look at them and go, man, this is a very laid-back, cool group of people. And you know what they're doing the first time they don't have water? They're ready to kill Moses. Mm -hmm. Why? Heart was hard. Their heart was hard. Can I say this, Christian? I mean this as gently as I can. Christian life's not all about you. Right. It's not all about what you get out of it. It's not all about your pleasure. It's not all about your comfort. I mean, I'm conscious. I'm very conscious of the fact that as Americans, we like space. Amen? And uh, listen, I mean, I don't know how you guys are, you men particularly. I mean, you know, when you first start dating your wife, you just can't hug her enough. And, you know, and then after a couple of years, you're like, I want my side of the bed. Get off, right? <laughs> Whatever happened, right? We like our space. I'm conscious of the fact that when you get to a certain size as a church and people don't have a chair between them and the other person, they go, I don't know if I want to go back there. Why? Because people like comfort. They like being uh, surrounded by things that make them feel at ease. And listen, I'm, I get that. I'm not against that either. I'm just saying that's how we're wired. We're wired to think, how can I be delighted? Not how can I delight him. And as time goes on, when you consider, stop and think, whenever you think to yourself, okay, this person's getting this out of this, what do I get out of this? Hey, can I say this? Preachers are no better. A preacher will stay up till 2 in the morning praying with somebody, and a month later that person will stab him in the back. And they'll say, what did I get out of it? You know what you get out of it, preacher, pastor? You know what you get out of it? You get out of it, Jesus Christ saying, well done. Amen. Thou good and faithful servant. Can I say this lastly? Your heart can get hardened by disconnecting. Mark chapter 6, go back there. We were there earlier. We were there earlier, Mark chapter 6. I'm asking you to hang with me here. We're on our last point. Mark 6, verse 32, they depart into a desert sh place by ship privately, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were a sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country roundabout in the villages and buy themselves bread, for they 
have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, <laughs> it's just like the Lord, isn't it? Give ye them to eat. You have to understand something about Mark chapter 6. You read this passage, you go, oh, those evil disciples. God should have killed them all. They're just terrible, terrible people. And they, they don't love people. There's no compassion there. This is the end of the day. They are in the middle of nowhere. There's no gas stations. There's no Walmart. A bunch of people keep coming after them. They've been ministering to these people all day long. All day they've been working and laboring. And at the end of that day, a crowd gathers. And the Lord, when he sees these people, he's moved with compassion. The disciples, not so much. Do you realize the disciples of Jesus Christ were the ones that pushed away the kids when the parents brought them to him? They were the ones that asked the Lord, Hey, Lord, uh, I noticed that they hadn't let you in the city. You want us to call down fire from heaven and kill them all? They were the ones that would be glad to send the multitudes hungry. You know what they do? They react to hard hearts. as hard hearts do. I read an article called How to Be Miserable. You ready? It says this, think about yourself, talk about yourself, use I as often as possible, mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others, listen greedily to what people say about you. You ever heard your name said or whispered? You know, oh, they're talking about me. <laughs> Expect to be appreciated. Hey, did the dishes. <laughs> All five of them by hand. Be suspicious, be jealous, be envious, be sensitive to slights. Never forgive a criticism. Trust nobody but yourself. Insist on consideration and respect. Demand agreement with your own views on everything. Sulk if people are not grateful to you for favors you've shown them. Never forget a service you've rendered. Shirk your duties if you can. Do as little as possible for others. You know what that will do? It will disconnect you from anybody. Those disciples who were supposed to be walking with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Those disciples who should have known better than anybody else. They look at the people, you know what they see? They see problems, they see issues, they see, oh, these people just want to take from us. They don't want to give anything, they're just going to drain us. Just send them away, Lord. A little four-year-old boy won a contest one time. They're going to give a contest for the kid that cared the most. This four-year-old boy was outside playing, and he saw his elderly neighbor, this widower, this man, outside just weeping on his front porch, sitting on his chair on his front porch with his hand, his head in his hands, and tears coming down his face. See so what happened? His wife had died. He was alone. And you guys are lonely right now, you and James, right? But can you imagine them being gone forever? His wife was. His head's buried, his head's buried in his hands, his tears just coming down. And that mother looked out the window. She saw that boy sort of skip and jump over to the neighbor's yard. Came back about 30 minutes later and she said, hey, uh, I saw you over there sitting on his lap. But what, what were you doing? What were you telling him? He said, nothing. I just helped him cry. Now, you may think that's a cute little story, but you know what sinners need? They need someone to sit with them sometimes and just cry. Some of you Christians know so much Bible, and you're callous towards people, and you'll walk by people who are without hope and without life, without Jesus Christ, and you won't look in their eyes. You know why? Because you know you shouldn't. Because if you do, you'll see something that, they don't, that, that you have and they don't. You'll see an emptiness. You'll see a vacuum of their soul. You'll see something that, that they're missing. And you've got the answer. But you don't care. Why? Because I'm just tired of people. All they do is drain you and take from you and hurt you. <laughs> My wife and I joke about this all the time. She's an animal lover. I'm not. Man, I like things that clean up after themselves when they go. <laughs> You know, 
I could do without animals. If I lived in a place with no animals, I'd be happy, I'd be fine. You know, we joke about all the time. That dog will never stab you in the back. But a person would, won't they? And as time goes by, you'll get callous towards people. And you'll close yourself off, and you'll be an island, and you'll walk by somebody you could talk to about Jesus Christ and not think about it. You won't cry about it. You won't shed a tear. Say, why? Disconnected. When you look in the eyes of people, you, you see, you know what? Yesterday when I was sitting down with that kid, and granted, he didn't agree with me initially, but we, the more we talked, just when you look in people's eyes, you see their soul. Do you not? You see there's something of eternal value inside of them. And, and because we are amongst crowds and amongst people all the time, it's easy to look and just, just walk and to do this. To walk around with your head buried in this. I've noticed now when people get on an elevator, they don't want to look around. They don't want to talk. I get in an elevator, I purposely try to put my phone away and say, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Good. <laughs> We've made it easy to become cave dwellers, haven't we? You knock on a door at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning and someone, yeah? Hi, I'm Pastor Adrian from New Heights Baptist Church. We're good? Is that a question you're good, or are you, do you know why I'm here? You're, you're here to talk about church, right? No, not really. No, I'm, I'm good. Slowly close the door back. And that may be the only time they open their door all day. You know what people do? They live in the cave. They go to their car looking at their phone while they're doing it. So they don't have to make eye contact and look at souls and see what's going on in the lives of people. And we're guilty of it as well. You're living in your little bubble of Bible-believing independent Baptists where everybody talks like you, says amen when you do. And you go out there and you see a kid that's all tatted and pierced up, and you say, I'm not going to talk to that kid. He might be the one that listens. Amen. But you're calloused in your heart because you're disconnected. You know what Pharaoh says when Moses comes and says, let my people go. That's what God says. He says, you know what? They're lazy. Don't give them straw anymore for, to make bricks. Make them go find it. Why? Because he hadn't had the labor. He was disconnected from it. The best managers and companies are those that work their way up. Because they know what it takes to get the job done. They know the sweat. The greatest person to help this world is the one who's been there. Amen? Amen? Let me see this world, dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes. A world of men who don't want you, Lord, but a world for which you died. Let me kneel with you in the garden, blur my eyes with tears of agony. For if once I could see this world the way you see, I just know I'd serve you more faithfully. Let me see this world, dear Lord, through your eyes when men mock your holy name, and they do it. When they beat you and spat upon you, Lord, let me love them as you love them just the same. Let me stand high above my petty problems and grieve for men held bound eternally. For if once I could see the world you, the way you see it, I just know I'd serve you more faithfully. Are you hard this morning? Let's all stand.